familiar swagger, but an all-new immune system. I mean, this is just the start of the journey, and so far we have done uh, very well. Currently, John is in complete remission. That means that when we look through a microscope at his peripheral blood, we see only normal cells. But doctors know there must be some cancer cells that survive the four weeks of uh, grueling chemical treatments. In and Stanford's recovery will depend in large part on whether remaining cancer cells can stand up to the stem cells donated by his sister. It's sure to be a tough fight, but Stanford says his nurses have prepared him for it. I mean, nag, nag, <laughs> nag. I mean, really, nag, 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 get out of that bed, go walking. So Though throughout much of the last so six months, walk. Stanford's doctors have encouraged him to exercise and to visit with his family. At times, his depleted immune system has forced him into isolation. For a man whose career and character have been built around human interaction, that's been the hardest part. The essence of being human is touch. For me, uh, not to be able to hug and to shake hands and... Uh, uh, pat people on the back, um, you know, that's, uh, that's it's tough for me. Stanford's first day out of the hospital was also the first day of school for Seattle Public Schools. Though he's got a lot of work ahead of him just trying to recover from this illness, he also expects to be able to tell a conference with people here at the school district headquarters within a few days. Reporting live in Seattle, I'm Christina McKenna, Cairo 7 Eyewitness News. Christina, thanks. A series of fires in Olympia overnight have investigators wondering if a serial arsonist is at work. Fortunately, no one was hurt in the three fires, which all broke out within a few blocks of each other in downtown Olympia. That's where Cairo 7 Eyewitness News reporter Neil Karlinski is now with details. Neil? Susan, you can see just how extensive the damage is here. This building right here used to be a warehouse. A few blocks away, another warehouse was burned. A few blocks from that, a car, all within just a few short hours of each other last night. Like a child's building blocks. What little was left of two Olympia warehouses was knocked down into piles of brick and rubble. The night before, huge fires believed to be arson did the real damage. I heard people outside yelling there was a fire. Betty Kaiser owns the apartments right next to one of the warehouses. Her tenants had to be evacuated during the fire. A day later, heavy water and smoke damage is keeping them out. All I can say is that whoever out there decided to go out and torch these things, I hope they sleep well because this is a horrible thing to do. This is people's lives they're dealing with. A third fire within just a few blocks and hours of the other two damaged at least one car parked on the street. All three fires are believed to be arson. At this time, we don't have a connection between the three of them, but the fire investigation team of the Olympia Fire Department and Olympia Police Department are working very closely right now on that uh, potential idea. Arson investigators have now split into two teams to look into the two larger fires, but considering the size of the fires, how quickly they burned, and the fact they were all just a few blocks apart, some of those who've been affected already have their own idea. I have no guarantee that somebody torched it, but three fires in one night in Olympia? I don't think we have to think about it too long, do we? Well, emphasis patrols will be out tonight just in case. By the way, this same building was the target of an arson just last year. Reporting live in Olympia, Neil Karlinski, Cairo 7 Eyewitness News. Neil, thank you. A hang gliding accident in Whatcom County killed one man and left another seriously injured. It happened around 3 o'clock yesterday afternoon in Silver Lake County Park. Police aren't releasing any details until the families have been notified. A body found in the parking lot of the Packar building in Bellevue has police searching for answers tonight. The body was spotted by a maintenance worker early this morning. At first, police thought it was a homicide. They're now looking into the possibility the man either jumped or fell out of a tree. The man who held police at bay for 13 hours at the Seattle Sheraton last November is now suing over the accident. incident. Rather. Ronald Lewis was arrested after his then-girlfriend told police that Lewis assaulted her and pointed a gun at her in the hotel room. Lewis says that never happened. He's suing the woman and the King County Jail for making false allegations. He's seeking $5 million in damages. 
They've reached a tentative settlement over the cleanup of the Eagle Harbor Superfund site. The state has accepted some responsibility and will pay $2.3 million. The federal government and PACCAR will also contribute. As part of the job, a layer of clean sand will be put over the island to cap toxic chemicals. In Newport, Oregon tonight, some sad goodbyes from Keiko fans mixed with little tension from his caretakers. Cairo 7 Eyewitness News reporter Chris Ligaris is live in Newport with that story. Chris? Keiko's trainers wanted to make this like any other day for the whale with a combination of play and exercise, but I'll tell you, that is a tall order, what with uh, news crews crawling all over the place. Whoa. Look. He's huge. It was the public's last day to see Keiko before his move to Iceland, and the killer whale didn't let the crowd down. It's incredible. Swimming by the huge windows of the Oregon Coast Aquarium so that many could say goodbye. It's kind of sad, but I think it's good for the long run, and I think he'll be happier. I think he'll be blessed there. He's blessed us here. It's wonderful. As for Keiko, he knows something's up. He's watched scaffolding go up next to his tank for reporters and photographers, watched his trainers pack up through an underwater window to their office. I, I think Keiko's try, trying to figure out what's next, you know, where, where am I going? While final adjustments are made to the stretcher and box that will carry Keiko to the plane, you can sense that no one is taking this move lightly. Everybody's a little tense. The caretakers are uh, loaded with work and of course the pressure of the media and the fact that uh, we, we're breathing over their shoulder all the time is adding to the pressure. The pressure, Jean-Michel Cousteau says, of delivering the killer whale safely and wondering whether this 10,000 pound animal will cooperate. If anything wrong happens, it's not because of Keiko, it's because of us. So that's what they're trying to avoid. The last time Keiko was put into that small medical pool and isolated, he had a tooth pulled. So what everyone here wants to know is, will he remember that? Will he hesitate to go into the pool this time? Reporting live from Newport, Oregon, Chris Ligaris, Cairo 7 Eyewitness News. And of course, Cairo 7 is following all the latest developments on Keiko's countdown to freedom. Later in this newscast, more on Keiko's behavior changes that signal he's leery of tomorrow's move. And then tomorrow, we'll bring you live continuing coverage of his trip to Iceland, beginning on Cairo 7 Eyewitness News at 5 a.m. and throughout the day. School is just beginning, but it's already report card time for Washington's fourth graders. New assessment tests show improvement in reading, math, and listening compared to last year, but still only 31% of fourth graders met standards for math. And in writing, less than 37% met the standard for listening, a 5% drop from last year. Seventh graders fared even worse in their first ever exam. Only 38% passed the reading portion of the test, and just 20% passed the math portion. Statewide, school officials like the trend. Especially in math and reading. And in Seattle, the numbers are even better. Cairo 7 Eyewitness News reporter Mike James is live in News Control with more on the impact of these test scores. Mike? Uh, Susan, the, the testing is mandatory in schools now to give the state and each district some kind of benchmark to measure what children know or don't know. The school we visited this afternoon is the best example of the uptrend. Almost eight of the ten students at Montlake Elementary meet tougher new standards for math and reading. And the ingredients that make a difference here are the same as anywhere. First, strong teaching in the classroom. I've been here ten years and we've consistently had strong teachers in the classroom and our parents demand that we have strong teachers. And that's the other part of the mix that makes this school work. Parents and a community involved every day. We have parents in the classes all the time uh, helping as tutors. We have a fantastic tutoring program. We have a fantastic PTA that gives us enrichment, that gives us assemblies, that gives us field trips, uh, cultural activities. So there are parents around all the time. Not every school boasts this kind of spirit, but the movement in Seattle is up. 36% of fourth graders meet the standard for math better than the state average. Writing scores are better, too. Reading's about the same. But it's also clear that too many students don't meet the standards. Still a long way to go. It's not a stopping place. It's not a place of contentment. It's a place of challenge and of opportunity for us to fulfill our promises to this city and its communities. Now, a word on the test. We're early in the game on these new standards. Some schools used the test for the first time just last spring, but teachers and parents like them because they measure not what students memorize, but how they think. Live in News Control, Mike James, Cairo 7, Eyewitness News.
And Mike, more school news now. Special needs children displaced by a moldy school last month have a new school tonight. The New Horizons School has been leasing its old building from the Highline School District. Well, now the school will be located in a facility in Renton near Valley Hospital, and classes are scheduled to start tomorrow. Hundreds of people went to work at a computer chip company in Puyallup today, only to find out they've been laid off. They gathered at this local pub to talk about losing their jobs at the Matshusta plant. The company officials say the troubled Japanese company forced the plant to shut down. Now the city of Puyallup is left with an empty factory and 350 workers are unemployed. It's kind of scary. Um, we have a baby, seven months old, that just had heart surgery and he's going to need more open heart surgery. And it's really scary. We're worried about insurance and how we can make our house payment. The company is working with the city of Puyallup to find another buyer for the site. New at 6.30 will bring you a live report on the impact the plant closing will have on the area and why workers say they've been through this before. A record day on Wall Street again. But this time, investors have reason to hope the impact on you coming up. Well, I'm hoping my mark is in there. Her bank was robbed, but they missed something valuable, the baseball card everyone wants in their collection today. Wiring problems that spark fires. More information is coming to light today that may help solve the mystery surrounding the crash of Swiss Air 111. And I'm Andy Wapley in the Cairo Weather Center. Fall feels like it's in the air. Can summer make a comeback? The five-day forecast is coming up. Plus, a man confesses to killing a young child. So why does the victim's family want another man punished? The answer ahead on Cairo 7 Eyewitness News. Whatever you do, don't blink. Real TV is the place to be with amazing people and incredible events five times a week. If it's caught on tape, you'll see it right here. Real TV is moving to weeknights at 7.30 starting September 15th on Cairo 7. I don't want to pull over. Hey, you guys. Hey, you guys. Here. The air is on. That's right. Hold down your window. No, roll off your window. Introducing Solara, an entirely different kind of Camry. It's for you. Hey there, this is your Colonel talking. Now I got something here that's downright fun. My new popcorn chicken. Crunchy morsels of tender white meat. It's mouth popping good. Woo, look at him go. Hurry down to KFC, try my new popcorn chicken for $1.99. It's more fun than watching me. Unless, of course, Colonel get funky. Go, Colonel. Go, Colonel. At KFC, we do chicken right. And not just in a bucket, neither. Occasionally, time flies even faster than usual. Like during the Dodge Summer Clearance. Where, for a limited time, Dodge Caravan, America's best-selling minivan, comes with exceptionally low 1.9 financing. Or select cash back instead, like $1,500 on Grand Caravan, or get $1,250 cash back on this caravan, making it America's lowest-priced minivan at just under $16.9. But please hurry, while time is still on your side. See the friendly Northwest Dodge dealer near you. Bad weather today hampered the search for clues in last week's deadly airliner crash in Nova Scotia. But news that the plane had a certain type of wiring, which safety has, whose safety has been questioned, has added urgency to the crusade of a Seattle area man who wants that wiring banned. Cairo 7 Eyewitness News aviation reporter Rick Price is live at SeaTac Airport with the latest. Susan, when Swiss Air Flight 111 crashed after reporting smoke in the cockpit, Patrick Price jumped. The retired Boeing engineer was thinking immediately of a certain kind of wiring, wiring that can burn furiously. This is the type of wiring that was on Swiss Air Flight 111. As you can see, it burns furiously under the right conditions. It looks like a uh, 4th of July sparkler. Retired Boeing engineer Patrick Price did a number of tests like that one during his career. All hell breaks loose. 
The revelation that the flight data recorder stopped six minutes before impact, coupled with the information that the jet was built with this highly flammable wire insulation, and the pilot's transmission of smoke in the cockpit, all strongly suggest an electrical fire on board. It has all raised new questions about the safety of this polyamide wire insulation. On this website, Patrick Price is one of the people asking those questions. After a series of problems, the U.S. Navy stopped using this type of insulation a decade ago. But the FAA still permits its use on commercial airliners. Patrick Price would like to see the FAA order the airlines to take this wiring out. More emphasis has got to be placed on the safety of wire in the industry of airplanes because it is so important to keep an airplane in the air. It's like, as again I said, your veins. If you think your veins are important to you, then you ought to think that the wiring on an airplane is very important too. Now we called the FAA with a number of questions today about where they are with this kind of wiring, where they might be going with it. At the end of the day, the agency told us they still were researching the questions and that they would get back to us tomorrow. Reporting live at SeaTac Airport, Rick Price, Cairo 7 Eyewitness News. Rick, Boeing's business has really been taking off in Britain this week, so far beating out European competitor Airbus at the Farnborough Air Show. Among the deals, one from Brazil for the first triple sevens to be purchased by a Latin American carrier. Boeing's also snagged orders for six of its business jets. Now that brings Boeing's total to nearly $3 billion in jets, while Airbus has sold $2.7 billion in planes. But that is close to Airbus's stated goal of 50% market share. Also at the air show, Boeing President Harry Stonecipher dispelled earlier reports about the management shakeup last week. He said Ron Woodard was fired as the head of the commercial division because his team, quote, did not have a plan in place to turn double digit profits. It's a twisted tale filled with allegations of abuse, murder, a fugitive, and an insanity plea. And it will soon play out before jurors in an Everett courtroom. North Sound Bureau Chief Tricia Manning Smith joins us live from the mobile newsroom in Everett. The defendant admits she killed her husband, a well-known school counselor here in Everett, but she says her own history of abuse, coupled with insanity, led her to commit the crime. Yeah, the truth sometimes is. In Seaside Heights, New Jersey, Patrick Dory has invented a machine that creates a beach blanket of advertising right in the sand, in this case for Skippy peanut butter. Right now, approximately, on this one half mile stretch, are approximately 5,000 impressions of Skippy peanut butter jars. This beach is more like a beach head in the battle for your attention. Do you get the feeling that advertising's everywhere? Oh yes, definitely. TV, radio, in the sky, on the sidewalks, in the street, now in the sand. <laughs> well, you can't get away from it. There are so many ads surrounding us that even the experts can't count how many we're exposed to. They throw around a lot of numbers, suggesting each of us sees and hears anywhere from 1,500 to 3,000 pitches every day. More and more, advertising is completely invading our culture. Barbara Lippert has been writing about advertising for 15 years. We're so inured to advertising. It's so much wallpaper in our lives. We're so overstimulated that advertisers have to find guerrilla tactics to get us to sit up and pay attention. At some cash machines, patrons waiting to get money see a pitch on how to spend money. On this supermarket floor, they're advertising for food. And on this moving staircase, they're advertising for advertising. And these days, any surface can be turned into an ad. In Atlanta, Robert Collier was happy to demonstrate his invention, a 3.2 million candle power light gun that can make billboards out of buildings. All the advertisers' weapons are trained on brand-conscious groups like this, young people with lots of disposable income. Traditional advertising doesn't work on them, but Eric Menzies is not traditional. You have to find the place where it's quiet, where the people are stopped, and where they can be attentive. And that is where? The bathroom. Menzies has chased consumers to one of the few places everyone must go. When I'm in the bathroom, you know, looking at nothing, at least now you got something to look at. You never considered that maybe the bathroom should be an advertising-free zone? I don't think so. 
I think that eventually there will not be one inch anywhere in our consumer republic that's not corrupted or invaded by advertising somehow. Chris and Anita Murray discovered even their New York apartment could not be ad-free. They found themselves stuck under the traveler's umbrella. The financial firm put its red neon logo on its building near the Murray's. Every day you look at it, it makes you think that someone has decided that our life is going to be dominated by a red umbrella uh, as the image that we have in our eyes and in our brains every night. The Murrays and hundreds of their neighbors fought travelers to get the neon sign dimmed. So at least at home, they can have the kind of commercial free peace and quiet we used to expect in the bathroom or at the beach. And that's part of our world tonight. For the CBS Evening News, Dan Rather reporting. See you tomorrow. Good night. This is CBS. 11 minutes of uninterrupted news, weather, and sports tonight on Cairo 7. And tonight on Cairo 7 Eyewitness News at 6.30, breaking news. Mark McGuire breaks the home run record. You'll see it next. Also tonight, heartbreaking news here at home. Hundreds lose their jobs. They did not let us know what was going on. Really hurts. Now this woman and her co-workers are laid off, but how could that happen in our boom economy? Details next in a live report. The mystery of a missing woman is solved. Her husband's alleged confession leads police to a remote grave in the mountains. We'll also take you live to see Keiko tonight. We're counting down the final hours, his final hours in the Northwest. Like this in Hawaii and in the Philippines and probably in Florida, they've never grown up here like this. Just how wacky is our weather getting? Could Seattle be turned into a tropical paradise? Good evening. I'm Susan Hutchison in for Joyce Taylor. I'm Steve Rabel. Cairo 7 Eyewitness News at 630 begins right now. With complete Northwest News coverage, this is Cairo 7 Eyewitness News at 630. I've been through a lot with this company, so I don't, I don't, I don't like being laid off. Imagine having to tell your family you're laid off. The sad but true story is hitting hundreds of homes tonight in Puyallup. That story new at 6.30 in a moment, but first, breaking news off the top. Indeed, Mark McGuire does what no other slugger has ever done before. A historic moment tonight, Mark McGuire at the plate, St. Louis Cardinal Stadium, gone. The 62nd home run of this season for Mark McGuire and the Cardinal Slugger breaks the long-standing record of Roger Maris. 1961, Maris slugged 61 home runs, and Mark McGuire has weeks to go before the season ends as he gets congratulations not only from his own teammates, but from the opposition, the Chicago Cubs. Renee Latchman, former Mariner manager, with a high five to Mark McGuire, he'll step on home plate. The record breaker tonight, this happened just about 15 to 18 minutes ago in St. Louis, and the party continues as Mark McGuire is congratulated first by his son and then by his teammates. We'll have much more on this breaking story as the evening continues, but a new record tonight for Mark McGuire, and now the question is, how many more home runs will the slugger from St. Louis hit this season? And we should know, too, that Sammy Sosa was playing in that game opposite Mark McGuire, came up, hugged him several times. Very sweet moment between the two of them. A great moment for professional baseball. And again, we'll have much more on this. And Tony will have all the reactions tonight coming up at 11 o'clock. Now, after the Labor Day holiday, hundreds of workers at a leading computer chip maker expected to go back to work. But instead, they were greeted with pink slips at the Puyallup manufacturer. Cairo 7 Eyewitness News reporter Margot Kim is live in Puyallup with the very latest. Margot? Steve, 350 workers are now unemployed here at the Machusta plant. They are proof that economic troubles in another country can affect many of us right here at home. Michelle Stepnowski and her fiancé both work at the Meshutsta company in Puyallup. With a six-month-old baby to support, they are now both laid off. We've been loyal. We expected some kind of respect where that's concerned, and we got none. We felt we should have been notified uh, at least two or three months prior to them all of a sudden saying, boom, you're laid off. 
The workers gathered at a local pub to talk about what's next, but they've been through this before. Medschutzta is the third computer chip maker to own this site in the last 16 years. But company managers say troubles in the Japanese economy forced the plant to close. Tony Killian has worked for Medschutzta for 10 years and made this shirt as a parody to the changing owners. But he says this time, the workers are getting some benefits. They are compensating us well. They're going to pay us till December 5th, which is nice. But in the end, it may be the city of Puyallup which suffers. Company managers say they are working on a plan to help the local economy. We'd be looking for new owners or other uses for the existing company to use the site. The city says the company has already paid $830,000 in property taxes, so the city of Puyallup has not lost any money yet. The task, the task now is to find yet another owner for this site. Reporting live in Puyallup, Margo Kim, Cairo 7 Eyewitness News. Margo, thank you. And more details now on tonight's top story. Machusta makes DRAM memory chips, but the market has been falling overseas. Workers will be paid their base salary until December 5th and will receive severance and vacation benefits. The company has hired an employment consultant to help workers find other jobs. A Renton man in jail for allegedly murdering his wife led police to the body of a woman on Snoqualmie Pass today. The site is just off I-90, about 10 miles west of Snoqualmie Pass. The discovery of the body came after 40-year-old Robert Dural had a meeting with prosecutors and police in jail today. Dural then went along with investigators to the site. Dural had already been charged with the murder of his 36-year-old wife, Carolyn, after police say they found blood in the Dural home, implicating him in his wife's death. Carolyn Dural's co-workers are now dealing with this news. You'd like to think that she could have lived a long life and died peacefully. So